Welcome to the Invest Well Show. As you know, I'm Michael Wall. I want to talk this show about a few things. One, we now know it's confirmed. Obviously, you've been seeing it all over social media, uh, the news everywhere. Twitter has been purchased by Elon for almost $44 billion. The question is, what does that mean to shareholders? And if you own a share of stock, how does that affect you? So we're going to talk about that today on, on the show. Secondly, the market, as I'm shooting this right now, it's April 26th. It's about 11.02 a.m. Eastern time. And as I'm, I'm looking at this right now, the market's down around 468 points. The Dow is anyways, which puts it down almost 7.5% for the year, year to date. Uh, so what does that mean moving forward? And also, we got stuff going on with Russia. What's going to be happening? What should we do with our wealth? Just a little market update today on the Invest Wealth Show. All right, so let's kind of first things first. I know some of you out there, as you're watching this and you're saying, okay, geez, Elon bought Twitter. Uh, what does that look like? How is that going to affect us? Some, some of you are excited about free speech and all of these things. Others feel like, oh, he's going to kill the system, whatever. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, when you take a look at what's happening here, if he stays true to his word and allows a platform that is free in nature, whether you like or dislike the conversation, I think that's super important and really a backbone to our country in a lot of ways. So I love personally some of the things that have happened there. But let's talk about actually owning the stock, right? So right now, again, as I'm shooting this, it's around 11.04 a.m. Eastern time on April 26th. And Twitter has actually react, reacted down a little bit. So the stock is down a little bit right now. Uh, he's got a bid to buy it out um, a couple of dollars more than it is currently per share. And so I know a lot of people are saying, well, will he take this private or will it stay public? You know, that's a great question. And I think a lot of people are asking, what's going to happen to my shares if I own shares of Twitter? There's been a lot of people that have kind of bandwagon bought along the way and said, I'm going to buy shares of Twitter because Elon's going to buy it. And pretty much everything he touches in a lot of ways turns to gold. They've seen Tesla. They've seen SpaceX. They see SpaceX. They've seen Starlink. They've seen some of these other things that have worked out really well um, and taken some years to develop, but ultimately have had major impacts on our world as we know it. And so Twitter, I don't, I don't think is going to be any different. I think he's going to really overhaul this process. Anything that he kind of puts his hands on, we know that he is in a place where he's going to be dialed in. He's going to be all in. He's going to look to really um, <clears throat> do what's necessary to simplify. And in fact, I think he's probably going to end up firing the board. We'll see what happens. But uh, that could possibly happen and occur as well. If he does take this private, then obviously all of the shares that are publicly currently owned, so if you own a share of stock publicly, which is the only way you can own it right now, uh, technically, um, your shares will te technically get bought out. So you will be exiting Twitter sometime in the near future as far as at least owning the share of stock if he takes it private. Uh, the only way, obviously, to buy in the private companies are either know the owner or buy in through some type of private equity offering. Uh, based on what's available and what's out there. So that could occur. That could happen. Uh, but he could also, who knows, you know, who knows what will go. He could keep it public. So we'll see what happens there. It'll be interesting to watch and see how that actually affects the other social platforms. You know, you may recall DWAC was a stock, DWAC, which is a, a stock that was used uh, for a company, digital assets, that were was literally, um, you know, fundamentally behind some of this truth media that Trump was coming out with. Well, that stock has been just bombarded in in the recent months, I think, due to this slow rollout. But then also the idea of uh, now Twitter being bought by uh, Elon. I think a lot of people are saying, OK, maybe this is the solution and this is the platform. So I want you to think about when you look at buying stock in general anyways, I want to challenge you to not buy things. This is my encouragement. Obviously, you make your own decision. Not buy things based on just emotions and, and, and media-driven opportunities. You know, we saw this back with GameStop and some of these other stocks that were um, pumped up by the Reddit boards, if you've seen some of those back in the day. And there were a lot of people that made a lot of money with those, but there were many, many more people that lost a bunch of money on those stocks because they were just following the kind of the noise of the day. It's so important. You know, one of the things that I did and, and our team has actually put up on screen here a chart of the Dow. And I want to take a look at that right now. That chart, <clears throat> if you take a look at this, it actually shows where the Dow was at the beginning of the year, uh, real close to 36,500 and where the Dow is right now at 33,573. 
ultimately, that red line that you see there in the down arrow is showing that, quite honestly, the Dow is in a reversal of trend. So are we in a place where we are moving into a recessionary time? Uh, I think there's a strong case for that, right? We're in a place where we've had a lot of money that's been printed over the years. We've had tremendous corporate buyback. For any of you that's watched me in the past, you've heard me talk about that, a lot of corporate buyback of stocks and equities uh, over the past several years, unlike we've ever seen before. One of the reasons primarily is because interest rates have been low. And as interest rates low, money's cheap. And then now we have the ability, CEOs and executives, to buy their shares back for virtually pennies on a dollar. So we got that stuff happening. And now we got you know, massive debt in the economy. We got significant inflation. If you haven't seen some of the conversation going around about um, there's like over 20 locations just in the U.S. alone where they are storing food and goods uh, that have actually caught on fire accidentally. Uh, I don't know that that's been accidental, quite honestly. But, you know, there's a, there's there's something happening here across the economy. And I think there's a desire for some things, unfortunately, negatively to occur. And I think when you just look at from a financial perspective, when you look at what's happening with Russia, when you look at our debt, when you look at uh, the stock market still being overvalued, and when you take a look at um, uh, consumers and where they are in general, uh, the shortages and, and all of the things with supply chains, you know, that we kind of went through. I think it's, I don't see how we don't walk through the next couple of years without some type of catastrophic recessionary period. So the question is, what should you do? How do you kind of prepare for those kinds of things? You know, just like when you would take a vacation or a trip, like if you take a trip and you're going to say, hey, I want to travel to here or there, and you get your GPS out or Siri or whatever you like to use, Google Maps, you can either speak the location, right, or you can actually um, enter an address in and, and then it'll find the location, the quickest route and the less traffic and sometimes the less traffic, not always, <laughs> but help you get there and help you get to where you need to go. But but the reality of it is, is if you didn't know where you were going to go, uh, if you had no idea, if you're like, you know what, I'm going to take a trip, but I really don't know where I want to go. I don't know where I want to end up. Um, and I, I think I'll just get in the car and I'll start driving and see if I get there. Well, that would be absurd. Obviously, you're not going to get there. You have to have an address. You have to have an address. You have a plan <clears throat> on actually how to get there. Even if you haven't been there before, a lot of the tools that exist today, GPS tools, actually help you get to where you're going. Uh, unless you're downtown in the big city and, and the GPS doesn't work well, then it may take you down a bunch of bad <laughs> roads that are in the wrong place. You're like, wait a minute, I thought you were supposed to help me, not hurt me. But in the financial world, I think when we talk about some of these things that are coming, recessionary periods, which I think are very likely uh, over the course of the next year, year and a half, two years anyways, with all of the factors that I just mentioned, I think we got to evaluate where we are, number one, in the stage of life that we're in, whether we're younger or older. We talk about that a lot, but that's very, very important. If you're younger... You want to make sure that you are ensuring that you have enough cash on hand. You're ensuring that you're in a place where you have uh, enough investment or excuse me, investable dollars ready to take advantage of opportunity. Maybe as a younger person, one of the best investments that you can actually make uh, for you and your future initially is actually in yourself, in your training, in your growing, in your and just your process of becoming a different, better person, because you'll never uh, return void the investment in you. Now, I'm not saying don't go invest in the stock market, but I do want to challenge you to think about that. If you're older, let's say you're older and you're retired or you are looking to retire. I call it the um, five to 10 years from retirement, also known as the financial red zone. Right. Just like in football, the red zone, what do they do? They change their defense. They move into the prevent defense. They move into the <clears throat> hey, we're going to stop you from scoring a touchdown. And when you are ready to retire, if you're five to 10 years from retirement, you're literally in a place that if the market implodes and it drops 30, 40, 50, 60 or more percent, if it reverts back to the mean, depending on how far it drops, you're literally in a place where you're losing 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of your portfolio. And if it takes four, five, six, seven years or more to recover, well, now you're in a place where you've you've potentially pushed your retirement date back. If you are retired, you're literally in a place now where you have to say, wait a minute, I my ability to create additional income, to create additional wealth has gone away because my working years are gone. So the importance of protecting my wealth 
is very, very, very important. So this is kind of like in a consumer awareness, right? Consumer alert. If you have all of your monies in the stock market right now, all of them or a high percentage of them, I'm going to challenge you to really think differently about what you're doing. Even though we have inflationary times and the conversation is, hey, with inflation, you need to be in the market. I'm going to challenge you. you got to think differently because if we do have some of these recessionary market periods, I don't know if you realize this or not, but when the Great Depression happened, late 20s, it took the markets almost 30 years to fully recover. And check this chart out on the screen. Almost 30 years to fully recover for that market. Very important. Now, will that happen again? I don't know. But what I know is if you're all in the market, you got to think differently. I think you got to think of a perspective of how you're getting off market, how you're preparing differently, how you're looking at different investment structures via private equity, direct real estate that's off market, insurance-based contracts that have an element of safety uh, to them, at least from the markets and things like that. And you keep the gains when you make them and really create the right blend in what you're doing. So I just that is really my challenge today. Obviously, the sponsors of our show, uh, Lean on the Wall, or really Wall Private Wealth and U.S. Private Wealth Companies are companies where we have a great team of people where we wear some other hats helping families throughout the country protect, grow, and reduce taxes on their wealth. If you have questions right now, you're concerned, we have some great white papers. We have a lot of great information. Uh, we also are in a situation where we have uh, some information via like TED Talk style videos talking about the importance of efficiency, efficient portfolio, which is the trademark process over there, talking about private equity and how that works. So just educating yourself will help you experience and learn about other things maybe that you're not doing. Again, I want to tell you the best time to prepare is before a catastrophe happens. I know a lot of people spend more time preparing their vacation than they do what to do with their portfolio for their future. But I want to strongly urge you, whether it's the teams that are sponsoring this show, and you can, there'll be links on screen, you can follow that, or links below, you'll be able to follow that, or whether it's someone else that you're connecting with, I want to challenge you to step back and in this season, really reevaluate what you are doing. You've worked a long time for what you have, and, and, and if we go through significant recessionary periods, those that plan and prepare are going to fare way better than those that don't. So get prepared, stay focused, and don't allow the media to drive your investment decisions. Make sure they're driven based on what your needs and your desires are. Are. Hey, as always, my uh, desire for you is to share some content and ideas to help you think a little bit differently about your wealth, update you on things that are happening. If you've missed some of the existing Invest Well shows, we also did a three-part series, which you'll be able to find on investwellshow.com, talking about how to protect your wealth from a market crash. <clears throat> I want to encourage you to go there and watch that. Great information, three parts. Uh, you'll learn a lot from it, be able to take away a lot from it. And as always, share this with someone that needs to hear it. Listen, there's so much noise out there that people are interested in good information, but they don't always know where to go to get it. People don't know what they want because they don't know what's available. So by you listening to this and sharing it via podcast on your phone to the friends that you've texted this morning or yesterday that need to hear this, share it. Share it on social media. Share it with people that need to hear this. That's how we get the word out and help people become more prepared. So that way, more and more families in the country don't wind up caught in the dark when a recessionary period comes. They're ready for it. My desire is always in addition is to help you live on purpose so you can live with purpose. Be intentional in your life. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next show. Keep in mind the information shared on this show is not to be considered investment advisory advice. For specific recommendations based on your situation, make sure you reach out to a professional, whether it be financial, accounting, tax, attorney, or whatever you may need to help you find the information necessary to make good decisions.